Whitechapel, 1888. Murky streets lit only by a flickering gaslight, casting malevolent shadows in every corner. A looming, faceless figure leaning over a mutilated body, then disappearing like a phantom into the maze of narrow streets, letters written in blood. This is the case everyone has heard of, one of the original unsolved mysteries that not only haunted the streets of London's East End, but still haunts researchers and true crime enthusiasts today, over a century later. It's the first case where a nickname was bestowed upon the killer, a name so memorable it would never be forgotten. The very words conjuring up images of a demon dressed as a doctor clutching a bag full of implements of death. Although we'll soon see that this symbolic portrayal was far from the truth. This is the story of Jack the Ripper. It's also a story of the victims, the canonical five, Mary Ann Nichols, Annie Chapman, Elizabeth Stride, Catherine Eddowes and Mary Jane Kelly, as well as two women who were killed shortly before the Autumn of Terror, Emma Smith and Martha Tabram. Were they also victims of the bloodthirsty apparition we know only as the Ripper? Just like all the other unanswered questions, this case inspires we may never know. Read all about it. Read all about it. Horrible murder at George Yard. You are now entering London's East End to experience the Autumn of Terror. Please note that this episode contains adult themes and descriptions of violent crimes which may not be suitable for all audiences. The use of the term prostitution is in no way intended to cause offence, but it will be used in this series for historical accuracy as that is what it was referred to back then. Primary sources have been used as much as possible. This series has been created with the utmost respect for the victims in mind. Hello and welcome to Prasha's Murder Map. Thank you for joining me for this special Jack the Ripper series. We're going to travel to Whitechapel in 1888 to witness the series of gruesome murders that would forever mark East London on the map as home to one of the most famous serial killers of all time, Jack the Ripper. I'm honoured to announce several very special guests who will be voicing characters for me throughout our journey. A huge thank you goes to Peter Blexley, author, broadcaster and former Scotland Yard detective, Carl Kopak, ripperologist and writer of the Ten Weeks in Whitechapel series, produced by Rippercast, Philip Hutchinson, author, ripperologist and co-founder of Lucky Dog Theatre Productions, as well as several fantastic podcasters. I'll list them out alphabetically by the name of their show. Charlie and Eileen, hosts of Crime Lapse. Jenny, host of It's Murder Up North. Emily G. Thompson, author and host of Morbidology. Eric Rivenus, author, historian and host of Most Notorious and Where Blood Runs Cold. Adam, host of UK True Crime. They'll be appearing in later episodes of this mini-series, so listen out for them and I'll be putting links for each of these guests in the show notes to their websites, shows, books or social media, so please check those out too. Twenty other people have been involved in bringing this show to life, friends and people I know who are involved in amateur dramatics, so a big thank you to all of you too. So let's imagine ourselves as time travellers, newly arrived in the late 19th century, standing on a street corner, by this time, London was the biggest capital city in the world and the centre of the British Empire, ruled by Queen Victoria. The West End was affluent and enjoyed plenty of new restaurants, hotels and concert halls, whereas the East End had only pollution, overcrowding and poverty. 
In 1887, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle published the first Sherlock Holmes novel, but books and entertainment were a world away for the inhabitants of Whitechapel, an area which stretched between Allgate and Spitalfields in the west to Mile End in the east. It was the worst district in the city, avoided like the plague by everyone except those who had no choice. There would have been a melange of sounds all around you, horses' hooves, the cries of market traders, dogs and cats, hurdy-gurdy music, people talking, shouting and laughing. I've created an immersive soundscape, which you'll hear a few times throughout this series. Let's listen to some of it now, to get you into the spirit of the time period. We'll be visiting in seven special episodes, released over a period of just two weeks. There are a couple of Easter eggs in there, which those who are already familiar with the case might pick up on. So listen carefully each time I play a part of the soundscape. Two pence a pound of grapes, three a penny on the floaters. Who'll buy a bonnet for four pence? Pick them up cheap here. Three pair for half a penny boot laces. To give you in charge of the police. You can do so if you like. Must <coughs> get food. I've lost my key. I hope you enjoyed hearing that snippet. You'll hear some more as the mini series progresses. So, what else would you notice if you went back in time to witness Victorian Whitechapel? It was a labyrinth of narrow streets, home to slums and tenement buildings, with 800 people crammed into every acre. Streets were only wide enough for a hansom cab to pass, which was a horse-drawn carriage and the main method of transport around the city for those who could afford it. For everyone else, walking was the only option. You would hear the clip-clopping of horses' hooves almost continually as there were around 11,000 handsome cabs in London and over 50,000 horses. But it wasn't just the sound that would hit you, it was the smell. A few years later, the city would experience the great horse manure crisis, as streets became so full of the stuff that authorities could see no way to solve the problem. The answer was as dramatic as it was unanticipated. Henry Ford's motor cars had replaced horse-drawn travel almost entirely by 1912. But back in 1888, this was nothing but a distant dream. The stench of dung and horse urine wouldn't be the only sense to fill your nose as you walked the cobble streets, although technically they were made from sets, not cobbles, which were squarer and more regular. Your nostrils would be assailed by thick black smog drifting over from the West End factories, the pungent smell of fish from the docks and the fetid stench of cesspools and drains under the houses in the days before more sophisticated plumbing solutions arrived. The sewer system was built by civil engineer Bazalgette in the 1860s, which reduced outbreaks of cholera and typhoid, but hygiene for people living in the East End remained poor as they had to queue for hours to access parish water pumps to wash themselves. It was against this backdrop of overcrowding, disease and poverty that the Whitechapel murders took place. There were 15,000 homeless and many more hopeless. Women whose husbands had either left them or died often had no option but to turn to sex work, which in those days was referred to as prostitution. So I'm in no way intending any offence by using that phrase but we'll do so in this series to represent it as it was historically. It's commonly believed that there were five Jack the Ripper victims and these murders are known as the Canonical Ones or C5. But some Ripperologists question whether all of these were the work of the same killer and some believe that other murders should be included in this list. Before we get started on the five Canonical Murders, We're going to use this first episode to examine two murders that took place just before what we call the Autumn of Terror, included in the more loose grouping called the Whitechapel Murders. 
I'll discuss whether I think these were ripper killings, and I'll give you some more historical context as we go along, because let's face it, London in the 1800s was a very strange and different place from how we see the world today. Even us Brits struggle to understand some of the old-fashioned phrases and customs from those times, so I'll do my best to paint a picture for you, and I'll explain everything clearly, especially for those from other parts of the world. So let's go back to that street corner, as you take in the melee of sights and sounds. The cries of market traders, the snorting of horses, and the mass of bustling humanity around you. Each person passing by has their own busy life, and their own worries in this unforgiving world where there were no guarantees and no safety nets. As you watch, the brutal story unfolds. Emma Elizabeth Smith was born in 1843, so in 1888 she was 45 years old. She sometimes claimed to be a widow, but at other times said that she'd left her husband years ago. She was often witnessed getting into fights and frequently sported a black eye or a collection of cuts and bruises. Like many people in the area, she was a heavy drinker. She was 5'2", with a fair complexion, light brown hair, and a scar on her right temple. She lodged at 18 George Street in Spitalfields, and normally left at around 6 to 7pm to look for customers, as she turned to prostitution to earn money to pay her way. Before we go any further, I'll explain what a lodging house was. Emma Smith had been lodging in the same place for many years, but many people had to take a bed anywhere they could find one, and they had to be paid for each night, usually at a cost of fourpence. If you didn't have your fourpence, you didn't have a roof over your head. It was as simple as that. Or if you only had tuppence, you could drape yourself over a washing line strung up across a room along with lots of other people, which was probably a little better than sleeping on the floor. And no, I'm not joking. You didn't need to worry about oversleeping either. In the morning, the landlord would untie the washing line so everyone would be rudely awoken as they tumbled to the floor. People referred to their fourpence fee as their DOS money, which just meant the money they needed to pay for a bed for the night. Emma Smith left her lodging house at around 6pm, as usual, on Easter Monday, April 3rd, 1888. At around 1.30am, she was passing St Mary's Church when she saw three men approaching her, one younger than the others and probably under 20. She felt uneasy and crossed the street to avoid them, but they followed her. She began to run, but the three men chased her. They caught her at the junction of Wentworth Street and Old Montague Street and Osborne Street and Brick Lane near Taylor's Cocoa Factory. She was beaten, robbed and subjected to a horrific sexual assault just a minute's walk away from the safety of home. Mary Russell, deputy manager of the George Street Lodging House, was horrified when she saw Emma staggering home sometime later, her face bloodied and her ears cut. Emma! Whatever happened to you? I I don't like to say. We need to take you to the hospital, love. Come along with me. Emma was reluctant, but Mary insisted and walked with Emma to the London hospital. Mary and another lodger there at the time, Annie Lee, were astonished that she'd made it home in the state she was in. At the hospital, house surgeon George Haslip treated her as best he could. Despite drifting in and out of consciousness, Emma tried her best to describe her attackers and the details of her assault. Sadly, she died of peritonitis just a few days later, although some sources state she succumbed to her injuries within hours. Detective Inspector Edmund Reed headed the investigation for the Metropolitan Police. This name might be familiar to you, because he was played by Matthew McFadden in the BBC series Ripper Street, whose storylines were fictional but placed in an accurate historical context. The real Inspector Reed discovered that at 12.15am on the day of the murder, a fellow George Street lodger, Margaret Hames, had seen Emma Smith near Commercial Road and the East India Dock Road talking to a man in a dark coat and a white scarf, but it was thought unlikely 
that he had anything to do with the attack. It seemed clear from Emma's story before she died that the assault was perpetrated by three men who were likely members of a gang. Many streets were infested with gangs and prostitutes were particularly at risk from them as they used violent tactics to extort money, sometimes on the pretense of offering protection. But although gang violence was not uncommon in Whitechapel, the sickening attack on Emma Smith was particularly brutal and shocked the city. Unfortunately, there were no witnesses and nobody was ever brought to justice. It's been suggested that the old Nickel Gang were responsible, but it turns out that there's no evidence for their existence, and this name was probably invented by ripperologist Donald McCormick in 1959. Whichever group was responsible, or even if it was just three men unaffiliated with an organised gang, it was almost certainly nothing to do with Jack the Ripper. But because the murder of Emma Smith occurred in the Whitechapel area just a few months before the C5, it has become viewed as the first in the series of unsolved murders of prostitutes. Read all about it. Read all about it. Horrible murder at George Yard. Another one? Tell me, young man, what's all this about? I need to tell my listeners the latest news. Another murder, innit? A woman being done in. Down the George Yard buildings. Read all about it. Who was the victim this time? Dunno. They ain't identified her yet. Are you buying a paper or not, Gov? Not today, thank you. But here's a coin for your trouble. Crikey. Thank you, sir. Have a splendid day. Sorry about the interruption. It sounds like we'd better not waste any time. Let's move on to the next crime scene. At around 4.45am on Tuesday, August 7th, 1888, Dock labourer John Reeves was getting ready for work. The sun was just rising and he yawned as he left his room at the George Yard buildings and made his way towards the stairs. What he saw there shot him into immediate wakefulness. A woman was lying on her back in a pool of blood, her hands clenched at her sides. He ran to fetch the police and PC Thomas Barrett, badge number 226H, hurried to the scene. The report described the victim as follows. Age, 35 to 40. Profession or call-in, prostitute. Height, 5 foot 3. Hair, dark. Complexion, dark. Dress, green skirt, brown petticoat, long black jacket, black bonnet, side spring boots, all old. Cab driver Alfred Crowe who also lived in the George Yard buildings, had returned home at approximately 3.30am that morning and noticed a shape on the first floor landing. But as it was still dark, he couldn't see that it was a body and assumed it was a homeless person sheltering from the wet weather outside, which wasn't uncommon. The door was usually kept open so anyone could get in. Residents Joseph and Elizabeth Mahoney had seen nobody on the landing when they passed at 1.40am. Police took a photo of the body and it was removed to the Whitechapel Mortuary, also known as the Dead Shed, as it was really just a brick shed in Old Montague Street, which no longer exists. Dr Timothy Killeen conducted the post-mortem and estimated the time of death at around 2.30am. He found 39 stab wounds, including 5 to the left lung, 2 to the right lung, one to the heart, five to the liver, two to the spleen and six to the stomach. But the focus of the attack had been on the breast, belly and groin area. Killeen believed that all but one of the wounds were inflicted by a right-hander, probably with a penknife. He thought that the final wound was made with a dagger or bayonet to the heart. Although doctors and surgeons were well versed in knife wounds at this time, Modern forensics now show that it was unlikely a bayonet was used because of the way the skin yields to stab wounds and they believe that all 39 probably came from the same weapon. It could be that the same place was stabbed more than once, affecting the depth and size of the injury. Unfortunately, the post-mortem report no longer exists so we only have newspaper accounts to go by. The problem was that nobody knew the victim's name. Three people had given three different identifications of the corpse, so on Thursday, August 9th, the inquest was adjourned for two weeks. 
that same afternoon, prostitute Mary Ann Connolly, alias Pearlie Pole, came forward with a name. The victim was 39-year-old Martha Tabram. Shortly afterwards, Martha's estranged husband confirmed the identification. She was born as Martha White in 1849, and her parents both died when she was just 16. On Christmas Day 1869, she married foreman furniture packer Henry Tabram in St Mary's Parish, Newington, and they had two sons. By 1875, the marriage had deteriorated, not helped by Martha's heavy drinking. But even after they separated, Tabram continued to support his ex-wife with 12 shillings a week. Even with this relatively generous payment, Martha harassed him in the street, pestering him for yet more money, most of which was spent on more alcohol. As a result, he reduced her allowance to two shillings and sixpence a week. Excessive drinking was a problem all over the country, but the media tended to focus more on the blight of alcohol in the East End, perhaps with good reason. Magistrate Montague Williams said, There is no mistake about what is the cause of nearly all the crime in the East End of London. The curse of all is drink, and I must say that the wives are often worse than the husbands. You might wonder why so many people in dire straits would rather spend their last pennies on alcohol than a good meal and a safe bed for the night. But maybe living in such a desperate situation, with little hope of future security, and at risk of violence every day, people prefer to be intoxicated for a while to forget their daily troubles. It's easy for us in our comparatively comfortable modern lives to say their little money should have been spent more wisely. But we have to remember their world was very different from our own. Also, drinking water in many areas was unsanitary and carried disease, so people didn't have many other options. After Martha's breakup with Tabram, she started living with carpenter Henry Turner. She had a habit of staying out late until 11.30pm because she'd been taken to the police station to sober up after having hysterical fits or seizures caused by excessive drinking. Turner didn't have a regular job in 1888, and made ends meet by selling cheap trinkets like needles and pins, and the two of them lodged at a house in Commercial Road. Their landlady, Mrs Bolsfield, once said, Martha was a person who'd rather have a glass of ale than a cup of tea. Around July 1888, Martha and Henry left their lodgings without giving notice, as they were struggling to pay the rent. Shortly after this, the couple broke up. Martha went to live at Satchel's Lodging House at 19 George Street in Spitalfields, but despite continuing to sell trinkets, she couldn't pay the DOS money, so she resorted to selling her body like so many other women in the area. She had no idea that finding enough rent money would soon be the least of her worries, and that she would meet a terrible end just a couple of weeks later. John Reeves, the man who found her body, said he'd seen no footprints on the stairs and no sign of any weapons. Detective Inspector Edmund Reed took on the case. Pearlie Pohl, who'd made the identification, claimed she and Martha had been with two soldiers on the night of the murder, one a corporal and the other a private of the guards, between 10 and 11.45pm. They'd allegedly walked about Whitechapel, going from pub to pub, and then separated. Pearlie Pohl going with the corporal, and Martha going with the private, with obvious intentions. Funnily enough, PC Barrett had also seen a private of the guards at around 2am on the night of the murder, when he was on patrol in George Yard. He reported that the soldier said he was waiting for a friend who had gone off with a girl. D.I. Reed arranged for all the corporals and privates from the Grenadier Guards who had been on leave on the night of the murder to take part in an identity parade. The military were very willing to help and Pearlie Pohl was asked to attend the next morning to see if she could recognise any of the men, but she didn't turn up. Police finally found her on Sunday 12th of August and she agreed to go to the tower for the identification the following morning on Monday the 13th. Luckily, she did show up this time, but couldn't see the two men. PC Barrett also attended, but failed to identify the soldier he'd spoken to. 
Two days later, D.I. Reid took Pearlie Pole and P.C. Barrett to see the Coldstream Guards at the Wellington Barracks to view the soldiers there. This time, Pearlie Paul pointed out two men, a corporal and a private, but they had strong alibis. The police investigation was thorough and they inspected the men's bayonets but found no evidence. Despite Paul's adamance that she would be able to recognise the two men, it looked as though the case was going nowhere. It was interesting that nobody else came forward to corroborate seeing the group walking around the area on the night of the murder, as Paul claimed that she and Martha had spent at least an hour and 45 minutes in the soldier's company. Many researchers now believe that her story was a lie, fabricated to receive attention. This was supported by Edmund Reed's reports of Pearly Paul's mental state as she threatened to drown herself, but then claimed, <laughs> I only said it for a lark. In one of the final reports on the case, which can be found along with all the other reports and evidence from the Whitechapel murders in the Ultimate Jack the Ripper source book by Stuart P. Evans and Keith Skinner, world-famous ripperologists, it said, Inquiries were made to find some other person who saw the deceased and pearly pole with the privates on the night of the 6th, but without success. Pearlie Paul and the PC, having both picked out the wrong men, couldn't be trusted again, as their evidence would be worthless. The inquest resumed on August the 23rd. Martha's sister-in-law, Anne Morris, came forward to say she'd last seen Martha around 11pm on Monday 6th of August in Whitechapel Road, as she was entering the White Swan pub. Nobody witnessed anything after that. The verdict was that the deceased had been murdered by some person or persons unknown. It seemed that one of the most brutal killings London had yet seen would go unpunished. One question that remained was why didn't anyone hear screams? Surely Martha would have cried out or struggled while being stabbed 39 times. Although forensic experts still disagree today about which was the killing blow and in which order the wounds came, it's unlikely she would have died instantly and would surely have been conscious for at least part of the attack. It's possible that she was passed out drunk at the time of the murder after entering George Yard buildings to shelter from the elements for the night if she hadn't made her DOS money, which could explain the lack of screams. Superintendent of the George Yard buildings, Francis Fisher Hewitt, might have been able to shed some light on this as he and his wife's bedroom was just 12 feet away from where the body was found. Mrs Hewitt admitted to hearing a cry of murder, but was sure it came from outside in the street. She said, The district round here is rather rough, and cries of murder are a frequent, if not nightly, occurrence. I think it's strange that she could hear a shout from outside the building, but not one from just outside her own bedroom door. Those who want to believe this was a Jack the Ripper killing use this in their favour, saying that only he could have murdered with such stealth, disappearing into the night like a shadow without a trace. But a simpler explanation is that Mr and Mrs Hewitt did hear something, but were too scared to do anything about it. They couldn't admit to this, as it wouldn't go over too well if the superintendent of the building heard a vicious attack in progress and ignored it. Instead, when questioned by the press, he came up with this suggestion. It's my belief that the poor creature crept up the staircase and she was accompanied by a man, but a quarrel took place and then he stabbed her. But if he believed a quarrel might have taken place, wouldn't this have been audible from his bedroom just feet away? Perhaps this is more likely an accurate account of what really happened, which the Hewitts heard but refused to admit out of fear. They did have good reason to be scared, as unbelievably, newspapers in those days always printed the names and addresses of witnesses. The police must have agreed that Hewitt's statement was odd, as they didn't call him to the inquest. I don't think Martha Tabram was a Ripper victim, despite her murder occurring very shortly before the C5. But to understand why, we'll have to learn more about the mysterious, elusive figure known as Jack the Ripper, the barbaric manner in which he slaughtered women in Whitechapel and his possible motives. What was the driving force behind such a bloodthirsty monster who sunk to the depths of depravity? Although the East End was no stranger to violence, 
the murder rate in London was not as high as you might think, with just 28 homicides in 1888 out of a population of 6 million. But five murders in particular would stand out forever, living on in history for generations of researchers and criminologists to puzzle over. I hope you've found this episode an immersive and useful introduction to the Whitechapel murders, and it gives you an idea of what the area was like. Join me again next time for part two of this mini-series as we examine the first of the canonical murders officially attributed to Jack the Ripper. Pack your DOS money and a change of clothes because we're going to stay in London's gloomy, labyrinthine streets for a while as I release a total of seven episodes over the next two weeks. Leave your top hats, capes and Gladstone bags behind because we're going to cut through the myths and use only the facts as we progress through the autumn of terror and see if we can put a name to arguably the most infamous serial killer of all time.